When I was trying to rank them, I had to really try to parse through why would I put this in fifth or fourth. Ultimately, I don't think it was a huge difference, but I know that the rankings would affect, even a ranking between a four and a five would affect if a, if a book would be moved up or not. I just didn't feel interested in, like I would be reading it and I would literally be like, this is so boring. I'm so bored. I'm so bored. Why am I so bored by this book? And that is not a good reaction <laughs> to have. Now we get into my top three. <laughs> Which are a little bit more fun to do. Yeah, I feel, I feel like I really fell for this book in a big, major way. Hi everyone, it's me, Jess. I am here to walk through, talk through my rankings for the semi-final round of the BookTube Prize. I read six books in the judging round for the semi-finals. I'm also judging for the finals, which is taking place right now up until the end of September, I believe. Yes, the end of September, I'm pretty sure. And I just wanted to talk through my rankings of the six that I had in my group. My group was Group B for the semi-final round of the BookTube Prize. In no particular order, the books that I read were... Enter Ghost by Isabella Hamad, Lone Women by Victor Lavallee, the rest I don't have with me, they were taken out of the library, The House of Doors by Tan Tuan Eng, Tom Lake by Anne Patchett, Wellness by Nathan Hill, and The Reformatory. So actually I had to email Robert <laughs> to get my rankings again because I'd misremembered or I thought I was misremembering the order of some of the rankings for my rankings. <laughs> I just, there were a couple of books that, this was a very difficult round to judge, I thought. I guess when you get this far down, and other judges have said this, when you get this far into the rankings for a prize, the books get better and better because they've been read by more people and therefore more people agree that they're good. That being said, I definitely had trouble with a couple of books. So I'm gonna go from lowest to highest in my rankings. And yeah, I had to email Robert to get my rankings because I was a little muddled between what I'd put uh, in several different spots because some of the books I really had a difficult time choosing where their ranking should be. For me, when I think about the judging, I always think about the fact that the ones that I put in my top three are going to move on to the final round, potentially, if other judges agree. So I always think of that as the cutoff. So I kind of thought about it in terms of, well, which are in my bottom three and which are in my top three. And that was a really difficult decision to make between a couple of different books, which I'll get into. But I will start with the one that I ranked the lowest all the way up to the one that I ranked the highest and talk a little bit about the books, what my experience of reading them was. The lowest ranked book in my rankings was Lone Women by Victor Lavallee. This was a very big disappointment for me. I was really excited to read this book because the premise sounded really incredible. It just has such a great hook. It's the story of a black woman leaving California and heading to Montana, leaving her past behind her and lugging a massive trunk along with her that holds within it some kind of secret. That was so interesting to me. Maybe was expecting too much from the book, I'm not really sure. And the beginning of the book is absolutely fantastic. It starts off so strong. First chapter is excellent and the chapters are nice and short. So it does have a good pace to it, but it's a short book. It's only 250, 270 pages in this version. I think that it really suffers from, like this is a really good idea, but not really necessarily knowing where to take the idea or how to focus the themes of the book, unfortunately. So Lone Woman is the story of Adelaide. She's taking advantage of the government's offer of free land in Montana and she leaves California after her parents were killed. There's a big fire and she leaves California with a whole lot of secrets and a big heavy trunk to head to Montana to take advantage of a government program where she re receives a plot of land. She can start fresh and it's at that point that 
the horror is supposed to begin in this story. And it's billed as a horror Western historical fiction novel. Yeah, like on Goodreads, it's in, in categories of horror, historical fiction, fiction, fantasy, historical Westerns, mysteries. Anyway, it starts off with this really great premise. And very early on in the book, we learn that the trunk that our main character Adelaide is carrying has within it ghosts, a ghost, a demon. So that's not really a spoiler. It was just such an intriguing concept. This idea of this lone individual making her way in this desolate land that hasn't been tamed, which is a pretty simple idea. It became, as I continued to read, very complicated with the introduction of many different characters and many different ideas that were being explored, but that were never really explored in any depth. So ideas or characters even were introduced and then they were dropped. So it was really underdeveloped, I thought, in the second half of the book. And chaotic enough that I started to have difficulty following the plot because the plot, the plotting of the second part of the book or the plotting of the majority of the book, I thought was quite weak. So because the plotting was weak and we had these different storylines of different characters that were kind of <laughs> diverging from one another and coming together not as well as they needed to. I really lost interest in this book. By about halfway, I, was start I wasn't so much getting frustrated as I was just losing interest in it. Now, of course, I finished it because I needed to read it for the purposes of judging it. But the weakness of the second part of this book meant that it was the weakest of the group. And it was such a disappointment because I was so looking forward to this. I was really excited to read this one. Some of the things that I think could have made this book better I do think that the horror elements in this book were not as strong as they could have been. And I think if the horror elements were better executed, I think that it would have held my interest more. Another thing that kind of took me out of the world of the book is that he, he uses language that it isn't like he uses a lot of swearing and he uses a lot of language that I don't think would have been language of the time. So I think that also, that did irritate me as well. I also personally think that the reveal of the trunk happened actually too early. I would argue that it happened too early in the story that I think that was a mistake in the storytelling. And I think that if the reveal had come a bit later and if some of the atmosphere and some of the horror and some of the relationships had been better developed before that was revealed, I actually think that would have worked better. I, I do think maybe it could have been a little bit longer. I'm not sure if length is the issue here or if, if it had just been maybe just better plotted. It, it, just, it just didn't work very well. And I, I really was disappointed. So it was just a, the plotting was a bit vague and a bit poorly and a bit poorly constructed. It just didn't fully come together. There are so many points that were dropped along the way. So in terms of representation, you have in this story actually black representation, indigenous American or Native American representation, Asian representation, queer representation in the book. And there's a trans character in this book as well. So I think that that was really interesting. Like I admire that that was presented in the story and, but I just felt like it wasn't well enough developed and I would have liked to have understood more about what those kinds of identities experiences were like in that place and time. And I didn't get enough of that for my preference. We're really introduced to a lot of different characters. When you're introduced to that many different characters, it means that some of them don't stand out as much or you want more from one character or less of another character. And I just think that, yeah, there were just, there was just so much of that that I eventually started to not want to pick the book up, which is very unfortunate. The other thing that I struggled with a little bit is that we do get the point of view of the demon in the story. And that I found a little bit confusing at times, a little bit 
it muddled me at times. I think that the story would have been better told if it had been told maybe 100% from the point of view of Adelaide. I understand what Lavalet was trying to do in terms of kind of making this omni, what's that word for like uh, when you see everything omnipotent. So an omnipotent kind of point of view of the storytelling, but it just didn't work. I found it actually to be off-putting as opposed to being engaging. I really like the female solidarity. I really like the idea of these independent women, the exploration of the role of these women at that time and their role in and, and cultivating the land and establishing a community. I really liked that idea and I really liked some of those characters. And I feel like that also, well, maybe it wasn't lost, but I do think that it it, it was the, it, I think it could have just, that could have been the focal point of the story and it would have been a really satisfying story. And just to finish off my comments, basically by the end of this book, I was quite confused about the story and about the plot, despite the fact that the ending does tie up very neatly. There were so many things that I had questions about that had occurred in the story that were that I didn't understand the meaning of or that I didn't I didn't know they were confusing they were they were confounding and so that is not a nice feeling to leave to leave a book with I sixth place for this one I can't rec I don't think I would recommend it actually honestly I I do want there's a part of me that wants to go and read this other book The Changeling because I feel like there's a lot of potential here and I really think that it had the potential to be great but it just didn't work. The next two rankings, I knew they would be in my bottom three, but I struggled with which one would be fourth and which one would be fifth. I ultimately ranked the reformatory in fifth place. However, I really enjoyed this read. I thought it was excellent. I thought it was really engaging. It is billed as a horror and there are ghost elements to the story. Again, it felt more like historical fiction with a kind of a ghost element that wasn't exactly scary or horror. In fact, the horrors of this story, of this novel, are the real horrors of the experiences of this one boy in particular, Robbie, and the other boys who are held in the reformatory, which is like a detention school or a reform school for kids who have broken the law or in Robbie's case, offended the very wealthy and very powerful white family, the son actually of the very wealthy and powerful white family in town. Robbie is 12 years old and in the incident where he ends up being imprisoned in this horrific place, which is based on, I'll get to it in a minute, but it's based on, so Robbie is arrested and he's sentenced to six months in the reformatory because he, I think, kicks a boy who was hitting on his sister Grace. Despite the appeals of his sister and other members of his family, he ends up being sentenced to six months in this reformatory. There's kind of two parts to the book. There's the part of the book that takes place in the school where Robbie is serving his sentence and the experiences that he has there. And then the other part of the book is focuses on Grace, his sister, and her attempts to try to get justice for Robbie and get him out of that place because the place is really terrifying. It's based on... So the reformatory in this story, which is called the Gracetown School for Boys, is the fictional version of the Dozier School for Boys, which actually existed in Florida in the 1950s. What is presented as a horror novel is actually a true horror story, really, once you get into the reading of the book and you understand that that, that this is something that is historical, that it's part of our, a part of the history of the United States. So the Dozier School for Boys also inspired the Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead, which I have not yet read, which I need to read. I think that Colson Whitehead's book is probably more critically acclaimed, but I will say that the reformatory was, I thought, very, very good. I loved the relationship between Grace and Robbie, the 
brother sister relationship and I love the character of Grace a very brave very tenacious young woman there's a lot of action in the story there are a lot of scenes that lead up to an escape or an attempt at a rescue slash escape that were just really compelling. I thought that the book had a lot of momentum. I thought the pacing was really good. There were some brutal scenes of beatings that were difficult to read. And there was a ghost, I don't want to give too much of the story away, but there's a ghost at the school named Blue who befriends Robbie and a couple of the other boys at the school. This ghost of Blue is seeking revenge. So Blue is clearly seeking revenge on the headmaster of the school or the warden of the school whose name is Haddock. He engages in the rela these relationships with the boys to try to, well at least with Robbie in particular, to try to uh, get revenge on Haddock. And so that's a subplot within the plot of Grace trying to get Robbie out of the school. So we have the plot a plot within a plot, which is always a really good structure. Very, very well-drawn characters as well. Haddock is a very villainous character, and there are a couple of employees at the school that we don't know whether they're good or bad. We don't know whose side they're on. For sure, Robbie questions who he can trust in terms of his relationships with the other boys and the people in the school. In particular, there's this woman, Mrs. Hamilton, who is is running a music program voluntarily at the school. She plays a really important role in the story. And so I thought that this book has had so much merit. I thought it was really well written and the plot is excellent. I had a few moments where I was having trouble be believing some of it, particularly Haddock as a character. He's quite evil, but his evil goes beyond a certain point of believability for me. So I thought that was a little bit of a weakness. But other than that, I thought this was an excellent, excellent novel and I really, really enjoyed it. I struggled a little bit with the length. I think that it could have been a little bit shorter, but even that was okay. I do think another part of the story has to do with their father who is falsely accused of raping a woman, a white woman in town. And we know that he was falsely accused because the white woman has admitted as much to many people in town. And we do, it is set up so that we believe that Robbie has been in prison to try to kind of smoke out his father who's left and got and run and run sort of from the law to Chicago to a safer place. The idea is that Robbie maybe was arrested as a way of getting him to return so that they could so that they could actually capture his father. The NAACP is engaged at one point. Gloria goes to meet with an NAACP lawyer to try to get help for Robbie. Robbie speaks to his father on the phone and his father doesn't come back. And I guess for me, I just that part I also found, I mean, I'm Obviously, that situation would be horrendous and impossible if it was a real situation, but I found it really disconcerting that these kids didn't have anyone really as adults advocating for them, and that really, I found that really troublesome. I don't know, there was something about that that really put me off. So these are just little things. When I was trying to rank them, I had to really try to parse through why would I put this in fifth or fourth? Ultimately, I don't think it was a huge difference, but I know that the rankings would affect, even a ranking between a four and a five would affect if a, if a book would be moved up or not. So I had to think really hard about where to rank it. But ultimately, I did rank it in uh, the fifth spot because I do think that it is, I do think that it was a little bit more commercial maybe than the other books. I mean, it was really good, but there were just aspects of it. I think the decision to make it horror was a really specific decision to make it a specific genre like that. I think that's going to turn some people off and unfortunately it might not reach as many people. So if it was just, I don't know, I have to read The Nickel Boys obviously to see how the that story could work more in a literary genre, if that makes sense. But I would definitely re recommend The Reformatory if you're interested in something like that. I thought it was really good. I thought it was very, very, very good. And I would like to read more of Hanana Reeves' books. This is maybe going to come as a surprise to some people or maybe as a disappointment to some people. I'm not really sure. It was definitely a disappointment to me. I ranked in fourth place Tom Lake by Anne Patchett. 
I love Ann Patchett, so I've read other books of hers that I've really enjoyed. I've read Bel Canto, I've read The Dutch House, I especially love Commonwealth. I think Commonwealth is my favorite book of hers. But Tom Lake, I, I struggled with Tom Lake, frankly. I thought it was kind of boring, sorry. <laughs> and I was really, really looking forward to this one. <laughs> So Tom Lake is set in 2020 in Michigan on a cherry orchard. This woman, Lara, has united with her three daughters during the pandemic. And her three daughters are, while they're harvesting the cherries on the cherry farm, the three daughters are pestering her essentially about her youth as a child actor in a theater company, one of these small theater companies. The theater company is called Tom Lake and it's on Tom Lake, which I guess is a real place. So the theater is overlooking this lake and the lake is I think called Tom Lake. So their mom, Lara, acted in a production of Our Town. It wasn't the only production of Our Town that she acted in. She acted in uh, or maybe she didn't act in, but she was helping with another production of Our Town when she was in high school. And <clears throat> I don't know the play of Our Town. I'm not sure that it would help or hinder me to know that play in terms of the enjoyment of the story. She is reflecting on that time in her life in the 80s and her experiences in this very small theater company performing this production of Our Town. And she meets and has a brief romantic, who becomes a very famous actor, a man named Peter Duke. Ultimately, the story of the girls' father and how the parents meet comes out through the telling of this story, not to give any spoilers away. And I and I thought that, that, that it was, I, I mean, it was fine. The book was fine. I think the problem is just that for me the characters were quite flat and I had a lot of difficulty kind of keeping up with my interest in the book. I don't know. I don't know if it was just the format of the storytelling in this particular instance. I was really hoping to have a similar experience with this book that I had with Ann Patchett's previous books and I just didn't. It like it certainly is a beautiful novel and I know that a lot of people love it and I think that it's beautifully written but it was just too quiet, it was too subtle, it was it was sort of boring, it was sort of lackluster in a, in a certain way. And I couldn't engage with the characters, I couldn't fully engage with the characters for whatever reason. And that is, it was a very different experience for me in reading this novel than in reading others of hers. And I was a little bit miffed by it. I couldn't understand, I can't really put my finger on what it is about this partic particular novel that I just didn't feel interested in. Like I would be reading it and I would literally be like, this is so boring. I'm so bored. I'm so bored. Why am I so bored by this book? And that is not a good reaction <laughs> to have. I know that I was supposed to love Tom Lake. I know that it was supposed to be like a delightful coming of age, story of coming of age for our main character, Lara, as she was acting as Emily in the play. But I just, but what happened to Ann Patchett's spice? Like where has her, where was, there was no rivalry. I felt like the character really didn't, the characters didn't have that much ambition. I don't, I didn't, there wasn't as much pain as in other stories. I think she attempted it with the eldest character whose name is Emily. I think she attempted a little bit of friction with that character. It was, just wasn't enough for me to be really hooked in. Everyone is just so understanding of one another and so caring of one another and there just wasn't enough meatiness or drama to the story for me to, to stay interested. Even the characters like that were jealous of one another weren't, there wasn't enough of it for me to really feel enough tension in the telling of the story for it to, to keep me, to keep me from being bored. And I, I just, it's so sad. There is a pretty good plot twist in this book. I will give it that. And I did think that the writing was beautiful. So I did put it into the fourth place, but it did not make it into the top three for me. So now we get into my top three, which is a little bit more fun to talk about because I really enjoyed these 
three books. I had a little bit of trouble figuring out which one to put into third place and which one to put into second place, although I knew what I wanted to put in the first place after I read it. The book that I put into third place was a bit of a surprise to me. I didn't expect to really enjoy this book as much as I did, but I knew as soon as I started reading it after the first chapter, I already felt like, okay, this is a this is a higher level of writing in my view. It, it just was was more interesting. I felt more compelled to pick it up. I was more interested in the writing than the other three books. I think that says a lot. It's not an easy thing to describe, but it's not an easy thing to like put your finger on, but the writing was just very good quality writing. The story was decent. I really enjoyed the story as well. And the book that I'm talking about is The House of Doors by Tan Tuan Eng. I ranked it third in my rankings and it was a lovely surprise for me. It's a historical fiction book set in 1921 and it's it's a great story of it like it has that friction that was missing from Tom Lake for me that I wanted. It has a lot of those elements in this story and it has characters that you get frustrated with. I felt a lot more invested in and interested in this story. It's about a woman named Leslie and her husband Robert. Their relationship to a man named an author named Somerset Mom. He's a famous writer and an old friend of Robert's. He goes by Willie. I'm just going to call him Willie. He arrives to visit them for an extended stay with his secretary Gerald, which who he's having an affair with. The problem is that Willie has is is experiencing some setbacks, some difficulties, and he's working on a new novel and he decides to write about or have it be inspired by the wife of his friend, so Leslie. It's set in Penang in Malaysia and it's very beautiful beautifully written. It's I thought that the descriptions of Malaysia were really wonderful. And Willie has hidden his gay identity. He's married to a woman named Siri who he lived with in London and they had a daughter. But Willie has traveled so much with his secretary Gerald so often and he's not really home much. So their marriage of convenience is really unraveling at this point. And he has other problems besides just his marriage. He's he, he's suffered a huge financial loss. It's not really a spoiler that comes out at the beginning of the book. And he's having difficulties with his health as well. And on the other side, Leslie and Robert's marriage is also kind of a deception too because both had adulterous affairs. So what I think is really wonderful about this story is the friendship that grows between Leslie and Willie and is depicted through the telling of the story and the narration of the story. It goes back and forth from Leslie's perspective and Willie's perspective during this visit. I really enjoyed that. We also get to learn a lot about a particular murder trial involving a woman named Ethel Proudlock, who is a friend of Leslie's. And it is really gripping, that part of the story. I found it really, really interesting and really gripping and fascinating. It's the story really that Willie becomes interested in and wants to ultimately write about. I don't think you need to be a Somerset Mom a fan to enjoy this book. I certainly didn't know who he was before I read this book and I really, really enjoyed it. I learned so much about that period of time and about that part of the world and I thought it was wonderful. I thought that the love and the intrigue and the exotic setting I don't know, it really worked for me. Uh, the writing really worked for me in this one. Oh, and there's also the story of Sun Yet Sun, who is a true historical figure of, of that time. That was so interesting. Who is in town to raise money for his cause of over his for, to raise money for his cause of overthrowing the Chinese government. I found that really interesting as well. He wants to establish a republic in China. All of these stories kind of inter are interwoven together, and it worked really well for me. I thought it was a wonderful read. It was a little bit slow at first, but very but very atmospheric and. It really picked up pace as we started to learn the stories of this trial and of these different characters and what was happening at the time. I had no trouble at that point with my final two. I put Wellness by Nathan Hill in the second spot and I put Enter Ghost in the first spot. I'll talk about Enter Ghost in a moment. I don't think this will be a surprise to people who watch my channel in terms of me loving Enter Ghost. But in terms of Nathan Hill's Wellness, this was a discovery for me 
I never would have read this book if I wasn't judging for the BookTube Prize, and I'm just so glad that I did. I really, really enjoyed Wellness. I thought it was witty. I thought it was funny. I thought it was just so good at capturing this span of several decades between from the 1990s all the way up until now how the culture has how our culture has changed over time i thought that was just so well presented in this book wellness tells the story of jack and elizabeth who were married who fell in love were married in the 1990s and are after having been married for such a long period of time are trying to understand their relationship and how to I guess, save their marriage or enrich their relationship, enrich their marriage as the length of the relationship has gone on for so long. I think it addresses, it is called wellness. So there's quite a lot in the book that addresses this whole idea of what happiness is, what wellness is, what a fulfilled life experience is. And it's dealt with in a really interesting way through the relationship of this marriage between Jack and Elizabeth, who really do love each other, but are experiencing individual expansion and growth and personal revelations that are not necessarily following the same path as the, that would be impossible, right? It would be impossible for it to be exactly the same for both of them. As a Gen Xer, I feel like that's a big part of why I really enjoyed this book because the nostalgia of the 1990s is, is so strong in terms of, well, Jack's like, a, he's a photographer and just all the descriptions of Chicago in the 90s, which is where they met as students. All of that was so well written and so true to so true to the experience of living through that time that I really enjoyed that. It's a very, very long book. I don't know how many pages it is. Maybe like 600 pages, 611 pages. So it's quite a long book. And I have heard it criticized for that. Like people have said, oh, it should have been cut down. It should have been cut back. But I, I don't agree. I, I really enjoyed all of it. I enjoyed because he does, he does go down a few different rabbit holes with the narrative. And some people found that really distracting. And that, but I found it really interesting and I enjoyed it. The book itself despite having this as a focal topic, the idea of Jack and Elizabeth's marriage does cover a lot of different topics and does so fairly critically. It covers the impact of the internet from the 1990s until now. It, it talks, it, there's a lot of focus on wellness in terms of health and health trackers and a lot of it is really funny and ironic and it, the way that it's presented is almost hysterical in terms of fitness programs and health trackers and open marriages and conspiracy theories and it also deals with art and what art is and so many, it covers so many different areas so well. It's a little bit hard to describe in a really succinct way. I think, but I think ultimately that wellness is a story about sort of hope and believing in your relationship or believing in yourself in a certain way. Jack himself has a lot of insecurities and Elizabeth has also her own neuroses, which are explored in the story. Really thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was great. Very humorous, very funny. It will definitely make you laugh. And, um, but it's not like a feel good book, if you know what I mean. Like it, I think it's quite a serious book in, in, in a way, the way that it looks at the state of our the state of human beings now, the way we are now and, and what we're obsessed with and what we are, how, how we kind of value, what do we value in terms of our relationships and in terms of our lives. It's a, it's a great, it was a great book. I'm really happy that I discovered it and I think it's well worth reading. A book that I think would be great for a book club. If you're looking for a book club book, it is long though, so I know that that will put people off for book clubs. But if you're looking for lots of topics to discuss, it gives you a lot to chew on, a lot to think about in terms of our inner lives, in terms of our outer lives, in terms of our relationships, art, 
so much, so much to talk about in terms of this book. Oh, there's like a whole bunch of stuff on parenting in it as well. I think that Nathan Hill is a genius and I think that the characters that he created in this book are so well rendered. They're so specific. There's so much detail about these two characters and their experiences and their inner lives and their relationship. It's, it's really good. <laughs> really immersive. Yeah, I feel I feel like I really fell for this book in a big major way. So the, the book that I put in my first ranking was Enter Ghost by Isabella Hamad. I've been really looking forward to reading this book. Enter Ghost tells the story of Sonia who's been living abroad in the UK. She returns to her home in Palestine uh, to spend time with her sister after the breakup of her marriage and subsequently uh, uh, an affair that she had. She's an actor and over the course of the time where she's visiting her sister Hanin, she meets this kind of eccentric director, this woman named Miriam. And this woman Miriam is putting on a production of Hamlet but it's being produced in Arabic and it's being performed in the West Bank. Originally, Sonia agrees to read the part of Gertrude and she's doing the reading in Arabic. And she, she starts off reading the part and then she ultimately ends up performing the part. It brings her back to her her roots. Like, so she ends up as a result of participating in this play, spending more time in Ramal Ramallah than she ends up spending in Haifa where her sister is a professor at the university. And there is a lot happening uh, politically. There are, there's a lot of supervision by the Israeli forces. There are a couple of points where they go through checkpoints that are stressed like really stressful. The performance is being performed in Arabic so it's being observed. There is a lot of political commentary. The art itself, like I'm not super familiar with the story of Hamlet and I think if I was more familiar with Hamlet I might be able to draw more insights into this reading of the story. Such, I feel like it's such an important book because it was such a strong presentation of modern day Palestine, obviously not as it is now, but as it was before the war broke out, this kind of presentation of this very artistic endeavor and these very earnest performers. And it, I just, the whole thing was so wonderful in terms of the representation. And I just, yeah. So it's a sad book to read in that regard, but I think also a really important book to read. It just it explores the whole idea of art and artistry under occupation or in an environment of occupation so well. And like I said, it's like it's a little bit difficult for me to pinpoint exactly where in the story there are a couple of different really important scenes. The the sort the novel is written in the format of a play in different sections. And that is really interesting. So I'm just gonna read you a little section to give you a sense of what I mean. This is Mariam, and it's sort of looking at this idea of art as a vehicle for the expression of something bigger than the art itself. And the discussion is about, oh, just let them enjoy art for art's sake. Miriam is very conflicted and she sometimes wonders if the art that she's making is going to deaden resist it, sort of dampen down the resistance that people might have. And she describes this in like there's a really interesting conversation to be had here about resistance. If I had more time I would talk about it a lot mm. more. But she one night in the novel she ex she extemporized upon the broader risk that art might deaden resistance by softening suffering's blows through representing it. And there's like a lot of reflection on the fact of you know them coming from European and Christian backgrounds and being able like for example Sonia being able to return to the UK if she feels that she needs to. And so there's like a lot of there's a lot of tension and there's a lot of conflict for Sonia in terms of her relationship to Palestine and her relationship to the cause or the resistance. Then Miriam responds with, let them eat cake, 
listen, you need to understand. And as she said this, she was trimming her hair over the bathroom sink, wetting it with her fingers, and then combing with her left hand to extend the curls and snip. A black curl fell and separated on the white porcelain. And addressing me in the mirror, she went on to explain her theory, which she presented as truth that when you read a novel about the occupation and feel understood or watch a film and feel seen, your anger, which is like a wound, is dressed for a brief time and you can go on enduring a bit more easily. And so time goes on running like an open faucet and each film at the cultural center ends and we applaud as the credits roll with a list of crests of institutional donors like great European aristocratic families of old. And while there are moments in these concerts and poetry readings and lectures and plays when you might feel connected to the other people in the room, to the people behind the screen, you might feel a kind of flowering in the chest at this sight of your community's resistance, embalmed in art, some beauty created out of despair. All of this means that in the end, you, or at least the middle classes, are less likely to fight the fight, because despair has been relieved momentarily, and perhaps our Hamlet would be just another version of this narcotic. And what, if anything, could we do about that? And so Miriam kind of has this big outburst, and she says, you know, let, like, so Sonia says, let people enjoy their art. What, what's the harm? And then Miriam says, and let them eat cake. And then Sonia's response to that is, I laughed, fatigue stops people fighting, not theater. So there's this, this whole conversation throughout this novel about resistance, about art, about occupation. And, and it's so beautifully represented in this novel. And I think it's all the more heartbreaking to read this book a year on from coming up onto a year on from the taking of the hostages, the taking to so the taking of the ho Israeli hostages and the actual war and the devastation that has resulted to the Palestinian people from that war. So I, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily here as a reader or as a booktuber to you know, pick sides and that sort of thing. But I do think that this is just a really wonderful book. I'm a little disappointed that this book did not win the Women's Prize, but I absolutely loved Brotherless Night as well. And I can see the merit of Brotherless Night as well. And I can understand that this would be a very political statement to make if this book had won. Uh, but I definitely think that everyone should read it. It's a wonderful book and just an incredibly well-told story and so much to think about and so much to consider. Anyway, I loved it, put it in first place and I adored this book. I thought it was incredible. I thought it was great. It was so wrought. It was so, she herself, Sonia is so, she's so complex as a character and she is experiencing so much through the visit home, the visit back to, uh, Palestine and there's really interesting conversations between her and her sister and about their past and about what they remember from the first intifada and then there's this really interesting dynamic with the members of this theater troupe and then she also has like still correspondence with her ex-lover back in the UK and you can see how she's really torn between these different worlds and it's very moving it's a very very good book so those were my rankings for the semifinals. Uh, obviously, I have a very big challenge ahead of me to rank the finals. <laughs> I'm going to reread, as I mentioned, I'm going to reread The Bee Sting, I think, because it was quite a while ago that I read it and it is in the finals grouping and I am judging for the finals. It'll be really interesting to see what my final final rankings are for the last six books. I'll leave a link to the list of those books in the description box below if you want to follow along or if you want to read any of the books that are listed for the final round. Really hope you do and 
If you've read any of the books that I read and you want to leave comments, comments below, please feel free to do so. You can agree with me, disagree with me. I'm completely open to any kind of conversation you want to have about books. That's what we're here for. Thank you so much for watching. I know it was a long one this time and I hope to see you in my next video. Bye for now. Uh, it's the story of Adelaide, our main... It's the story of Adelaide who has... It tells the story of a black woman heading to pursue a homestead, is that how you say that? so hard to talk about. I don't even know. Why was that book so friggin' hard to talk about? Oh my god.